Welcome to the San Francisco Writers Conference podcast, a celebration of craft, commerce, and community. I'm your host, Matthew Felix, and I'm here today with Kei Ming Chang. Kei Ming is a Kundaman Fellow, a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree. She is the author of the New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice novel, Bestiary, which was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and the Penn Faulkner Award. I should also mention that the paperback edition of Bestiary just came out, so go grab a copy of that. And finally, K. Ming's short story collection, Gods of Want, is forthcoming in June of next year, 2022. Welcome, K. Ming. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. I know you've had so much going on lately with the paperback coming out and the Lambdas and the Lammies and all, all of that. So thanks for making time to talk with me today. Let's just jump right in. Best Jerry, the paperback is just out. Um, that's what we're talking about mostly today. So can you tell those of us who don't already, well, I know, not those of us, <laughs> those who don't know uh, what Best Jerry is about? Yeah, so the novel follows three generations of Taiwanese American women. Uh, kind of called in the book, grandmother, mother, and daughter. Uh, and it's basically about unbearing um, family histories. And it's also a kind of subverted coming of age story with a lot of elements of fabulism and folklore. Yes, it is. Um, I did some reading up on you before today and read some other interviews so that I could kind of cheat. And one thing that you said kind of about overall what the book is about, um, I really liked what you said. And so I was just wondering if you could kind of touch on that. This is from your... Um, what was it? AAWW, Amer Asian, Air Asian American Writers Workshop, right? Uh, interview. And you said, quote, I was interested in a coming of age story that wasn't about running away from the domestic space, but about burrowing and binding and rooting more deeply. I, I loved how you said that. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so this is actually inspired by um, Jenny Zhang, who wrote uh, a collection called Sour Heart. Um, and I had the opportunity to take a class with her. And she talked a lot about the, the Western traditions of a coming, a coming of age story, which, which is the idea that you find your quote unquote true self or your independence once you leave the home, um, once you leave uh, sometimes family, sometimes family or household, et cetera. I um, mean, how she wasn't as interested in those narratives or that they felt in some ways not familiar to her um, in the way that maybe uh, in the Western imagination, it, it is such a prominent trope. Um, and I really, really related to that. So I wanted to articulate that. Um, and I was really interested in this idea that you could use speculative elements and imagination and turn them towards the past um, and that you could excavate and invent your own lineages. And that could be a form of imagination and not just um, straightforward research or something, something that's static, but that the past can also evolve um, and be full of speculation. I love that. And we're going to talk about a few of those things that you just mentioned in a bit. Let's talk for now, though, um, kind of my next question was going to be, and I think it fits really well with with some of the stuff you were just talking about is we said or you said it's three generations of Taiwanese American women. What is it about those intergenerational bonds that intrigues you? And I know I'm sure that that could be a whole hour. Like a lot of my questions, actually, there's so much because this book is so rich. I mean, the book, there's so many layers to this book, uh, but just sort of at a high level as it pertains to the book, what is it? Can you tell us a little bit more about your interest in those, in those intergenerational bonds? Yeah, it's so funny because a lot of people, I remember when um, people were first reading the book um, and they brought up intergenerational relationships and how they were really interested in how the elders of the book were, were humanized in a certain way and allowed to be complicated, mm -hmm. not just self-sacrificing, but also selfish and violent <laughs> and right. funny and crass rather than, you know, there's a figure of the grandmother as you know, this kind of self-sacrificing matronly figure who exists to give care to other people solely. And that's their entire personhood is giving. Totally, totally. And I think mothers are the same way too. Like we often say things like, oh, you know, my mother is amazing. She gave everything to, to raise me. She sacrificed so much for me. And that's what it means to be, you know, a good mother, a good grandmother. Um, and so I was interested in subverting a lot of those narratives and thinking about, oh, what would these women say about their lives? Um, and how would they interact with each other when their relationships, yes, are hierarchical and yes, are these systems and circuits of caring for each other and teaching each other, but also flattening those ideas of a hierarchy as well. Um, and how would they speak to each other and tell stories to each other and create narratives for their lives? Um, and to me, that was a very natural impulse. It didn't feel... Um, 
yeah, particularly strange or subversive or any of those things while I was actually writing it. And only later did I realize and was able to identify my intentions Mm -hmm. um, of how, yeah, how much I was really interested in also seeing these three generations um, because when they're in their perspective, when they're telling their narratives, they're all young. So the grandmother, um, she's speaking um, in, in, as her present self, but she's also talking a lot about her kind of early 20s. And the mother is recounting her childhood, her, for, her being 14 and 15 and 16. Um, so I was really interested in all of them as girls, too, specifically. Right, yeah. right. I love that. Um, what do you think? I mean, it seems like in our in, in American culture, quote unquote, to grossly overgeneralize, it seems right. like, you know, our focus is so much is on now and the future and what's right. new. And we don't necessarily in in our culture, we're not necessarily as interested in or we don't learn as much as maybe we should from the past. I know in my own experience, for example, talking about family specifically, I don't even know that much about my grandparents experience. I don't even know that much. And I think that's fairly common. Again, mm-hmm depending on the demographic and and the group that you might come from, but I don't think that's uncommon. So what do you think we lose? Because we've just talked about, you've just talked about a little bit about the benefits of exploring those bonds and why we might want to explore those bonds. What do you think we lose by not exploring those intergenerational bonds? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think think because oftentimes it's, it's also asking who has the ability to look back, who has the ability to be, you know, that historian or, or to be able to stand still in their own lives and look at the past in that way. And I think it really depends on people's circumstances. And it makes a lot of sense that it's this third generation of, of women, the daughter, who is the one who's attempting to do to, to look back mm-hmm. um, in a way that I think the mother wasn't able to, because so much of her focus was on survival, survival. and moving, moving forward in that right. way. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question uh, asking who gets to look back Um, and I think yeah it's really interesting because it's like how do you mourn something that you never really had or or never really thought that you wanted or were able to have Um, so I think in a lot of ways there's a really beautiful process of resurrection and regeneration that can happen um, when looking back and and a lot of records are broken or lineages are broken Um, so I guess I'm more interested in invention rather than a more like anthropological look at family Mm -hmm. histories. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a lot more dynamic and also says as much about the now and the future as it does about the past. Um, Yeah. Okay. And yet when we, when we do look not, and yet I should just say, and (laughs) when we do look at, at some of these, these intergenerational bonds, part and parcel to that oftentimes, again, depending upon our past is intergenerational trauma. Right. Can you talk about, um, and, and we now know, for example, I should, I should add, you know, it's really interesting that we're learning more and more that that trauma can get passed down, they think now, even in our DNA, never mind behaviorally and, and, and through the relationships and learned behavior. So, I mean, this, this idea of intergenerational trauma is, is really fascinating one, and it's obviously very important to your book as well. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, one of the central questions of the book, and one of the central questions I feel like I just have as a person <laughs> is... Mm-hmm is if it's possible to inherit memory, maybe not in a very literal way of like (laughs) having some kind of (laughs) um, pre-downloaded lifetime that you immediately remember. But I've always been really fascinated um, by the idea that your body can kind of know before your mind does and that it's possible to inherit memory in certain ways. And I've always been fascinated with past lives and like the Mm -hmm. multiplicity of selves as well. So yeah, I think the book is definitely looking at intergenerational trauma and how... Um, rather than this, again, I use the word lineage, but it's almost more of a circularity um, because I was really interested not in the women kind of getting farther from each other as each generation goes on or that they become more and more different, um, but that their voices actually rhyme with each other and that they're always circling the same questions, all three of them, and become kind of a mutable body um, rather than these three, you know, quote unquote individuals. Um, so that was, I was hope, I'm hoping purposeful and intentional. Um, and I'm also really interested because I remember in school, we learned about, you know, tabula rasa and this idea that that philosophical idea of like, we're all born a, a blank slate. That's and right. I remember feeling this very gut reaction of you're, <laughs> no, we're not. Mm. <laughs> this is so, it was so counterintuitive to think about that and so antithetical to the philosophies that I grew up with, which mm-hmm. were the exact opposite. Like all my life people, especially women in my family are always saying, this is your lot. 
this is what you're born with and you're never going to have any more um, or any less. This is, this is it. This is your, <laughs> this is your fate. This is what you carry. Um, and so I was interested in exploring that a little more. Yeah. Right. This is your weight. This is what you carry. And it's not necessarily wise to pretend otherwise mm. or self-serving to pretend otherwise. Right? right. So better to acknowledge we're not just a tabula rasa. We yeah. do have, we're inheriting a lot. And that doesn't mean we can't make our own decisions necessarily and strike exactly. out on our own paths. But yeah, it's, I think you make a really, really good point. Pret pretending otherwise that we're just starting with a clean slate is maybe a little, there's maybe a little denial going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about the three generations. We're going to talk a lot more about the three generations. But something you also did with this book is you told it in different voices and at right. least three different voices. There might have even been a couple others probably, I think, thrown in there. Why did you decide to tell it from the actual different voices? And was that challenging kind of from a craft perspective? Yeah, it was definitely very challenging because I, I always thought, oh, if you have these three different voices, they have to be extremely distinct from each other. They all have to have very separate desires. They all have to speak in a different syntax, in a different vocabulary, so that the reader intuitively understands, oh, this is another consciousness. Right. But I, as I said before, was really interested in how they're tethered together. Um, and I, there were certain words that I wanted repeated between the three of them, because I think it's part of what they have passed down to each other. Um, and part of this, these obsess same obsessions and desires that they circle. Um, and there's even like later on in the book, like asking the question of how long can you defer a desire <laughs> mm -hmm. um, before it finally comes to fruition or someone is able to pursue that desire. Um, so again, I'm really interested, I think, having these three separate voices where you're like, oh, these are different people, but at the same time, they, they share a consciousness in a lot of ways, maybe not in a very literal sense, but because um, they're not like, you know, fused brains or something <laughs> completely science fiction, though I would go in that direction, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> knowing my own impulses, um, but just that they're kind of psychically linked in that way. Um, and I was also interested in, again, getting to time travel between the characters. Like it was important for me to not for the daughter, she sees her mother as a grown person, but I wanted to make sure when the mother was telling her story um, through her own lens, um, with her own agency, um, that we could see her her own adolescence um, rather than her her present as a mother. I wanted right. to see. I wanted to write who she was before she was a mother, and that was really important to me. Um, and so I, I, I like that I could be more fluid <laughs> with yeah. the time between the three. Yeah. Yeah. And you just mentioned when the mother was telling stories. And so, so much of this, uh, so much of the book is about storytelling or, or is act not about storytelling. It is stories being told, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, so tell me how oral, the traditions of oral storytelling influenced your, your writing and, and, and the book. Cause it seems like, like I said, it's pretty prevalent, this idea of storytelling. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm really interested in oral storytelling because obviously there are a lot of historical uh, barriers to literacy um, in, in every family. And so I, I was really interested um, in what it means for these histories to kind of mutate as they were carried within each person and then handed down. And I was also really interested in how oral storytelling can be this very theatrical thing. You're fully embodying the story. It comes through the body, you know, literally exiting the mouth. And I just love that embodied form of storytelling. And even though what I, you know, grew up reading and loving, what I wanted to write was text. Um, I wanted to capture that spirit or maybe not capture that spirit, set that spirit free on the page of um, how oral storytelling is, can change based on the speaker and how, um, like I always say that like text is really authoritative. There's something very rigid about it and very canonical about it. And I was like, oh, what if the story kind of plays with itself and gets a bit meta and is like, that's not true. But what I just said was not true. Right. Which is what, which is in an oral conversation, that kind of thing is natural because there's something, I'm not saying like speech is less authoritative, but compared to text, you know. Right. Um, and so I was like, oh, what if the, the text is able to contain those um, like, oh, this is a performance. Um, and here's the performance behind the performance and the story within the story within the story. And like, oh, disregard that. And actually, here's a footnote, like kind of a conversation with itself. Yeah. Right, right. I said at the beginning that the book is very layered. And I think you just illustrated that very well, right? <laughs> it's like stories within stories. And also, I mean, um, well, I'm, I'm going to make that point in a second. I have a related point, but I'm going to hold, I'm going to bite my tongue for a second. I'm going to ask you something else before we move on, which is 
in an interview with the Adroit Journal, mm -hmm. you talked about, quote, uh, the process of writing the book was very fragmented. I was writing it more in sections and imagining it more as a collection rather than as a cohesive whole. And yet it did end up a cohesive whole, even though there's still a lot going on, like we've already talked about. So can you talk a little bit more about the process of turning what you thought was a collection into, into what ultimately is, you know, sort of a unified narrative arc, even if, again, there's a lot going on? What was your process to getting to that point when you realized, actually, this isn't a collection, I want this to be a novel? And, and how, how did you do it? Yeah, I mean, I really think it had to happen that way. Um, otherwise, I don't think I would have ever finished it or been able to conceive it. I think the first thing I ever wrote was like the pirate story, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. just on its own. And mm -hmm. the last thing that I wrote ended up being the first thing in the book, um, which is really interesting. Um, so it was, yeah, it's almost like I had to free myself from thinking about narrative and narrative conventions and plot and all of these um, these fiction terms that would have really scared me or intimidated me or made me feel like what I was doing was wrong or, or transgressive. Um, it really freed me if I thought, oh, I'm writing this fragment. It's just a story. It's just mm -hmm. a story. And then it kind of proliferated into many. And I saw the common threads between them um, and then was able to find ways to unravel them and stitch them back together. But I think that process of just, um, yeah, allowing something to be its own structure without me imposing it on the piece first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then eventually, like you just said, stitching it together, like realizing yeah. having allowed yourself that freedom and allowed these different stories to kind of manifest and exploring them right. and letting them come to fruition. Then you realize there is enough here. I've got the puzzle pieces and they actually do fit together. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole. Yeah. It's just, it's, it was, I think, realizing that I wanted them to be experienced in a certain order or a certain way and that there had to be some pruning that had to happen um, and some, some kind of narrative drive. Like it doesn't have to be in, in the most conventional way, but there still should be, at least for me when I was reading, it's like, I still want there to be a, a, a sense of momentum. Right. Um, and also just unlocking for myself um, this order that I had already accepted as the order because it was the order that I'd, I had written, written it in. Yep. Um, I was like, oh, it just became really static in my mind. And I feel like there's so much more room for meaning and interesting things happening if I just like break out of that mindset. Yep. Yeah. So oftentimes when I'm preparing for a podcast, I might be reading, you know, two or three books. And so even though hopefully I'm enjoying them all, I'm also aware that I've got a deadline, right? And so right. sometimes I'm trying to get through the book, right? Even if I'm hopefully enjoying it, yeah. still nonetheless, I hear the clock ticking and it's like, wait, yeah. I'm talking to K Ming on Tuesday. I've got... <laughs> But, and so sometimes I'm kind of rushing through the books, right? Yeah. Even though I'm also trying to, I'm taking lots of notes and I'm paying attention, but I'm, I'm rushing. I could not rush with this book <laughs> because, um, because, well, for a couple of reasons, some of which you've already touched on just the structure and the fact that it's not conventional, like linear A to Z, but also two things, two additional things really stood out, which one, the language itself, which I'm going to ask you about, but also just your imagination and just how imaginative it is. And so I was constantly wanting to stop or being forced to stop by the way you wrote it insofar as um, having to revisit something because it, the meaning is it wasn't necessarily cut and dry and I wanted to reflect on it. I wanted to reread something or so often there would just be this beautiful supercharged line that I would just have to sit with for, for a moment, right? And then revisit. And then just the poetry of the language. And so that's um, that's really what I wanna talk about next is mm. just, I didn't know you were a poet when I first started reading the book. Yeah. And I just kept thinking, God, this is so poetic. This is so poetic. And I loved that aspect of it because I love playing with language and I love, mm. and so, and then I found out she was a, you were a poet and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> wasn't just me, wasn't yeah. just me. So tell me though, um, how does being a poet and writing poetry affect your prose. I've been told, I remember I was, I was um, actually on a date with a poet who uh, was <laughs> pretty, pretty successful. And he said, uh, uh, you know, we can't be, you have to either, you're either good at prose or you're good at poetry. You're not good at both. Mm. Well, you are obviously good at both. So I'm just <laughs> curious um, how one, influ how poetry influences prose and or vice versa. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, I really love 
I, I really love when people tell me that they, they had to read it very slowly. Cause like on one hand, it's like, oh no, I hope it wasn't, you know, a slog to get through. And on the other hand, I, I feel like what's so beautiful about poetry is that you can't really speed read a poem. That's it. <laughs> Cause it's not the point. The point is not to go through it. The point is right. to linger and to be in that moment with that poem. Um, and I think that's part of the spirit that I brought to the prose, um, which is why I was so interested on the line level. Um, I, yeah, I was always interested in where can the language lead me? Um, and these moments of stillness um, on the page as much as like what will drive you to the next page. Um, and it's also really interesting to think about like, oh, not being good at both, because I feel like the process is the same for me. <laughs> So I yeah, don't even, yeah. yeah, so when I'm like looking at a blank page and starting, I don't even necessarily think like, oh, this is a poem, time for the poem brain, and like this is right. a poem, time for the prose brain. I think um, my process is really similar with both mm-hmm. um, in that I, yeah, I'm just very interested in language and in metaphor and in sound. Um, and then obviously with prose, sometimes it feels even more... Um, like I can, I can just, uh, I, I almost give myself more permission with prose in certain ways mm-hmm. because I'm like, I can be super wasteful with this language. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, seriously. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I don't necessarily think, I mean, people can write poetry that way too. Um, but there is like, it's like surgery or something. <laughs> like It's mm-hmm. like, oh no, like you move one word and the whole thing is. <laughs> no, there is um, a different sort of precision, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas with prose, sometimes I can, I can, feel like oh, okay you know what I can <laughs> that's fine like let's just keep following this thread so speaking of language I have a question I'm, I'm curious I mean I knew I know you're born born in California you grew up in California mm-hmm. but in your family did you speak uh, Mandarin or any of the other dialects or languages from Taiwan yeah um I I'm I spoke Mandarin at home or I, I speak Mandarin speak, at home yeah, speak, um yeah. But I, yeah, past tense. I forgot yeah. it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens sometimes. Uh, that can yeah. happen. Um, but what's interesting is that, um, like, my grandma, her first language is, is Taiwanese. Um, uh-huh. And so, so I what's recently... Taiwanese? Sorry, because there's Hakka. There's, I, there's oh, yeah, several there's, languages. Um, it, it's Hakkian, I think. Or is that Mandarin? Okay. Uh, it's Hakkian. Um, there's, like, Taiwanese Mandarin, which is its own. Like, that's the kind of Mandarin. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's Hakkian, I, okay. I believe. Um, yeah. More, coll- I guess colloquially it's called Taiwanese, but you're right. There are so many dialects. Um, uh, so it was really interesting. I, and all of my grandparents kind of speak different dialects. So interesting. Um, interesting. it was very multilingual. So I know like words in different dialects, um, but definitely Mandarin, I think is like the common denominator. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, the reason I ask, I'm just curious, do, do you think that knowing, cause I speak Spanish and French fluently, not native, but mm. fluently. And I speak a fair amount of Turkish. And for me, I have noticed that just, and again, I learned it as second and third and whatever languages, but still knowing a different language and looking at language through a different lens than just taking it for granted has definitely affected my writing. So that's why I asked you about Mandarin in your case. Yeah. Did you notice that that is, has influenced your writing in English? Oh, completely, completely. Uh, it's a huge, huge influence. I think maybe more than what most people would think. Because um, mm. a lot of times when people are like, oh, this is a really amazing image. This is really, this is really cool language. I'm like, that's just literally translated Chinese. <laughs> right. I cheated. I cheated yeah, on that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just, I love, I have like this entire notebook of aphorisms that I, I wrote down that just sound really cool when they're, <laughs> when they're translated. Like one of my favorites is you don't have to eat the pig to know it walks. <laughs> Great. Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, and we're going to give you all the credit for that. <laughs> or, or what was another one? Uh, or another one is um, rich people making money is like a, uh, a wave collapsing a mountain and poor people making money is like trying to cl- a, a turtle trying to climb up a wall, Ooh. which, is, <laughs> which is basically that like, if you're rich making money is so easy. It's a, it's right. a typhoon collapsing a mountain, but trying right. to make money. If you're poor, that's like a turtle trying to climb up a wall. And I'm like, that's yeah. brilliant. Right. That's brilliant. Right. And, and thank God most of my readers don't read Mandarin necessarily. So they'll never know. I got it from Mandarin. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, well, I just, I love all those things. And, yeah. um, and I, I do like the idea that like, there will be people who, who see it and like, I know what this is. Right. Uh, I know right. what this means. Um, and another one is like, when I was younger, I used to say things like, oh, my legs are super sour or my arm is really sour today. Uh-huh. People will be like, what are you saying? And sore is means sour. So like, oh. if you have soreness, you would say that the muscle or the thing is sour. Oh, this is something um, like the four acupuncture, the four Chinese medicine. 
Like they're sour. I, there's I, I don't know. It's okay. just, <laughs> just it's just like it's, it's just yeah. a thing that you say. And then I I remember um just thinking that was so fun. <laughs> I and technically, and then one of my friends is like, well, technically, when your muscle is sore, it's lactic acid. So it, it uh -huh. actually is sour. <laughs> it is acidity that's causing that soreness. Yeah. So kind of accurate. And so I, I started using that as well. I was like, oh, this is sour. This is and I started just using the word sour for all kinds of things. But um and yeah, I noticed definitely. that. I noticed that in the book, actually. Yeah, lots of sours. Yeah, um, because yeah. the word sour and just like tastes in general can salt, have a lot of salt. Yeah, are just more applicable to everything. You know, suffering is you know eating bitterness. I feel like a lot of people know that one. Um, and so it's very synesthetic, and um, I, I like that. I just like do, <laughs> doing that, and kind of the reverse is like I love saying weird things in Chinese that make no sense, but are things that you would say in English. <laughs> like, uh -huh. I just, I just like this idea. Like another thing is I read almost like, I, I feel like at least 80% of what I read is, is fiction and translation. Uh -huh. Um, cause I really love, and I love the feeling of like, this is a translation. Like I'm not, you know, sometimes translation is like, Oh, we were going to try to nativize everything so that it sounds super right. quote unquote, natural in English. And I'm like, yeah. I like things that sound unnatural. Yeah. I like, you know, the person saying their legs are sour. I like how weird <laughs> it because is. it gives us insight into that culture, that person yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. A different and it's also insight. language that surprises you. And it, I, I love language that is just surprising and jolts me a bit. And I like, okay. People say like, oh, I don't like being brought out of the book. I love being brought out. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, so the next thing I was going to ask you about, amazingly perfect segue, was language that surprises you or kind of shocks you. In the first few pages of this book, I don't know, piss comes up a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of shit in this book there. And I wrote a book, by the way, about bathroom, my experiences in bathrooms around the world. So I have clearly had oh, no issue with great. shit and piss. Oh my God. But, um, <laughs> but, but point being, when I wrote my book, you know, I was a little worried about, you know, people's sensibilities. And so I went there, but I would always try to go uh, there in a way that, you know, my aunt could read it or whatever. You don't have those kind of qualms. And so <laughs> it was really interesting that, yeah, you just sort of put it out on the table, right? And it's, um, and there, there's penises and there's yeah. you, whatever. I mean, it's just so real, right? So can you tell me about like, did you just not have this kind of concerns? You're just like this, I'm telling the story and this is just how it is. Where I mean, you're just maybe more courageous than I am. Can you tell me or, 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 and was it about that, that kind of, you know, doing that to the reader so that you're kind of waking us up and getting us to pay and getting us to engage and, and think differently. Like what, just share some of me, share some of your thoughts with me on that. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually wasn't aware that I was doing it while I was writing at all until my editor sent me a list. Oh my God, this is so funny. <laughs> my, my editor sent me a list of like words that I used a lot as you yeah. know, that's common in the editorial process. And right. it would be like shit parentheses like this many times I was like <laughs> how did I not notice that I love that I, I genuinely did not notice I had no idea I was doing it it was only other people telling me that made me suddenly self-conscious and self-aware that I was doing it and of course I do have to you know cut back too because sometimes <laughs> it's just like incredibly excessive but then I became worried like oh well people think I did this for the shock value because I right. think uh, and this is something I talk about a lot too, but I feel like those we are most intimate with and most comfortable with, we are most comfortable with sharing things about our bodies or, um, you know, there's so many stere like, so there's so many people like on Yahoo Answers asking like, when can I fart around the person I'm dating or whatever? Like are so there? many. <laughs> yeah, I got to so check out like, Yahoo Answers. Yeah, yeah no so idea. many, but yeah. like so many questions like that. And it's because it's a sense of like, oh, we're breaching some kind of social contract if we do this in front of each other and right because all the characters are so intimate with each other they are in really close quarters they don't really have the luxury of being very distanced from bodily functions um and are incredibly close with each other i just felt like they would have no qualms necessarily um and also given their own like labor histories and um like they yeah if for them it would be incredibly natural um and I feel like those that I am really close with, like we're able to talk to each other about those things and not like any kind of bodily function and not feel necessarily that it's totally. breaching something. Right. Um, I was like, oh, okay, so maybe this can then clue the reader into how, um, yeah, that how, yeah, that intimacy between them. But yeah, and I do, I do um, really hope that it's, not for shock value. And I, I try to not do that or avoid that. And whenever I feel myself 
just like being, I mean, I, I feel like there's, I mean, maybe I just have a very high tolerance for profanity of all kinds. Um, but I always try to remind myself that it's, um, it's because it's the voice, um, is what is leading and guiding those decisions. Yeah. yeah. And for me, and I mean, you know, again, I'm just one reader, but for me as the reader, it didn't feel like it was shock value. It, mm. to me, just felt like, like I, like I said a second ago, she's just laying it out on the table. Like this is just right. honesty. And these, this, this, this is indicative of, of the relationship that we're looking at here. And, and so, yeah, while I was a little jarred initially, just because mm. I wasn't expecting it, I didn't feel like you were doing it for that purpose. But Ooh. again, I'm just one, one, one little reader. And that, that, was, <laughs> that was my impression though. Um, but thanks for that. That's really, really interesting. So given all that, at the same time, you also said in, this was again with the Asian American Writers Workshop interview, mm -hmm. you said, quote, I wrote this book to be girly, mm -hmm. to be girl centric and feminine and strange. So we've already kind of touched on some of the strange, right? but can we talk a little bit about the girly and the, the girl centric? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was again, something I didn't realize I was doing, but actually what was really interesting is um, one of the first sections I ever wrote um, for what would eventually become this book was about the grandfather, the patriarch. And I remember showing this very small section. It was like 500 words, a couple of paragraphs. Um, and I remember her, Rachel Liza Griffith, the professor telling me, oh, what's most interesting about this is the women who are responding and reacting to him, not the patriarch himself. And I was like, oh, I thought I was writing. I thought this was like a grandfather story. Interesting. <laughs> um, and Interesting. that really liberated me and made me realize, oh, yeah, I'm interested in, in the women's relationship that surround him. Um, and I feel like so many, being in a lot of like spaces with aunties and mothers and women, it's men who are oftentimes like the entry point into, <laughs> into something that is really not about men at all. Like being with a group of women who are like talking shit about their husbands. It's not about their husbands at all. <laughs> right, it's right. about these women sharing their stories and talking to each other. But it's like through this, uh, <laughs> through this entryway of like the broader patriarchal structure. Um, and I really like that idea of like, oh, how do you navigate within that structure? If, if how we define family is like patriarchal and patrilineage, how, how do women navigate that and mm -hmm. work within that and respond to that? Um, and what does it mean to have power or no power within a family um, right. as a woman? Um, yeah, so that's how, <laughs> that's, that's how it came about, yeah. All right, awesome, thank you. So the other thing that I mentioned a second ago, um, or one of the other things I said, language, but also imagination. I mentioned just how ridiculously imaginative the book is and obviously you are. So can you, um, because one of the things I was specifically thinking as I cheat and look at my nose, notes again, and my nose, I guess, was um, it seems to me that you're able to just, and I'm projecting maybe here, or I'm, I'm asking the question, I guess, but it seemed to me again, as the reader, that you were not only able to access and almost surrender to your imagination, but really surrender in the sense of just seeing where it goes, where it, where it just ran with and just and trusting it in a way that I don't know that all of us are able to do. So I was curious, could you tell us about kind of both to your fellow writers, but then also readers, how you sort of access your imagination and embody your, inhabit your imagination, but then also, if I'm correct, sort of surrender to it, kind mm. of your relationship with your imagination. Because again, it really stood out to me that, wow, she's so imaginative and um, just really curious about that. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I feel like for me, it, it comes from that relationship with language. I think surrendering to the language allows me to, to kind of go beyond my everyday consciousness um, and be really surprised. So oftentimes, you know, I'll start a sentence and I'll choose the next word based on sound rather than the meaning maybe. And so it doesn't mm -hmm. logically make sense, but I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, that's so interesting. Like moth and moon, they do kind of look alike on the page in a way. And I don't really know how to relate these two things, but I like that I began with this and ended with this. Um, it's like kind of playing Mad Libs with myself or something. Right, right. Um, and when that word surprises me or that image surprises me, it allows me to just like go off into and just pursue it further. I'm like, okay, I ended up at moon. Like, let's talk about the story of the moon. Let's talk about this other thing. And um, yeah, and I think rather than thinking, okay, how do I get to this next scene where this has to happen? Or how do I get to this situation where the character has to do this? 
um, the allowing the language to kind of snake around and, and uh, lead me down little pigeonholes, um, which I later have to call <laughs> and later have to pull back a little right, bit, right. Um, is a really freeing process. Yeah. But, and it sounds like you, you trust that process. You trust the language. You trust where you're being led, right? I mean, I think so many of us were battling the inner critics, right? Mm. And we would say, well, wait, Moth and Moon, yeah, it sounds cool, but I'm not writing about the moon right now. So I should, <laughs> right? And so I think it sounds to me again, putting words into your mouth slash asking the question is if part of that is the surrender and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's the trust that comes with that and knowing that it's okay that you don't know where you're going to end up. Cause then you can call it later. You can rework it later if you need to, but then again, maybe you don't need to. And maybe that's part of the beauty because you end up with these gems that you wouldn't have come upon if you hadn't surrendered and, and, and gone with it. Yeah. I really do think that comes from my background as a poet, because I think fiction has certain amount of, capital built into it. Um, it's so like tied to what we consider to be a marketable story or a sellable story in a way that I think poetry, obviously would be wonderful if poets got paid more, <laughs> mm -hmm, right. but I think poetry is in some ways liberated from that idea of like what's sellable. Um, and so I think it's like, what is a poem? <laughs> I feel like a very, a lot of people maybe would be able to define what a novel is but I feel like fewer people would be like, that's less kind of commonly in our consciousness of like, what is a poem? And so right. it, it really teaches you, you can just follow it because it can be anything. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be grammatical. It doesn't even have to have a plot or a character. It can be anything. And um, I try to bring that to prose when I can. It really right. depends on the project. Yeah. Right. I love that. I think that's another subject that we could talk about for a whole hour or six <laughs> hours. But in the interest of time, I'm going to ask my next question or series of questions. And this is just touching on some of the, the key themes in the book. Mm -hmm. And again, so many layers here. So there's so many different things I could have touched on. And I'm just going to touch on a few of the kind of surface level ones. And when, mm -hmm. I, when I say surface, I mean, just the ones that are most readily distinguishable as themes because there's right. this going on. Right. Um, and so the first one, and, and I had so many, I had to cut like, half of the themes I wanted to ask you about out because there is there again it's so rich but let's let's start with holes I mean there's a lot of holes in this book that's obviously a big part of it can you speak to kind of holes and and holes as a theme in the work yeah I mean definitely the holes are meant to be kind of uh profane as well and um kind of mimicking all of the orifices that exist on living I, I mean the idea that land is living as well I think is really important and informs that um a lot of indigenous Taiwanese storytelling is about how the land and the river and the sky and all of these things are living and have bodies no different from us, um, which is an idea that is very different from um, a lot of what later colonized uh, Taiwan. And so I wanted to write into that idea um, of the land having mouths and that these holes aren't just static things that some other active force punched into the ground. Uh, but that these holes were living and could speak and uh, make sounds and swallow and consume. Right. And speaking of the, the relationship of the holes to the body is there's, there's a, a powerful quote here that I'll read really quickly from Ma who says, quote, we aren't born anything but holes, throats and anuses and pores, ways of being entered and left, which is really powerful and speaks to my next question, which is, one of the other themes in this book is, is our relationship with our bodies and specifically the cost of, of having a body. And I'll read a couple just quotes about that and then ask you about that. Um, Ama asked if I knew the story of Hugu Po, which is the tiger story, um, quote, a story about the cost of having a body. Pen, the daughter's um, lover, who, who's also a woman, uh, mm -hmm. an adolescent says, quote, having a body is a liability and I like your body. And there's, there's a lot of other examples, of course, in the book where we're brought face to face with this reality of, yeah, there are a lot of beautiful things about having a body, but it is also a liability. Can you mm -hmm. speak to, the, to that, that idea of the cost of having a body? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely tied to that story of the tiger spirit, because what I was really interested in that story is this idea that she cannot um, be a woman without eating children in order, if she wants to have a human body, she has to hurt other people. She has to kill them. She has to be a predator. She has to inflict violence if she wants to be a human. Um, otherwise, she, she can't have this corporeal form. And I thought that was saying, even though it's a children's story, saying something very profound about how bodies always contain the capacity to harm and do terrible, terrible things. Um, and that will always be something that we carry. 
um, and that the women in this book specifically are hyper aware of because they have are carriers of violence um, and also have inflicted violence. Uh, and so that was what I was interested in is what does it mean to know that you care and kind of dramatized through the tiger tail. What does it mean to know that you essentially are like constantly weaponized or, right. or carry this, this capacity that you know is in your lineage or that you've witnessed and that what uh, the characters themselves have the potential to continue to do that generation after generation. Right. Right. Which goes back to some of the, the intergenerational trauma that we talked about earlier. Um, so another part of having a body in this book, and we just touched on a couple, couple more times, but the protagonist daughter develops a tale, mm -hmm. a literal tale on her body. Um, so tell us about that. Tell us about the tale. Yeah. So the tale, I mean, I do like that. It's a pun because it's like a tale, tale, T-A-L-E, T-A-I-L. -E, right. Um, and the holes hole with the, with the H <laughs> or the, with the right. W, like I, I enjoyed those word, <laughs> word right. play. Right. Um, but yeah, the tale was really interesting because originally it was just like a blip in the narrative. And it was my uh -huh. editor who actually suggested that the tale become a tether throughout the whole story. Um, and that's how um, the the relationship between the tale and the girl became such a central one. I mean, I was really interested in this tale being a double-edged inheritance, something um, that is beautiful and incredible. And she can use it to like hurt other people who, who she believes deserve to be hurt, but also... Um, that because of that, it carries terrible power too. Um, so was, I wanted her to kind of live with that, similar to intergenerational trauma of carrying both stories um, and the capacity to be violent. Right, because the tale, like you said, it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, on the one hand, it is beautiful and fascinating. And it's the sort of source of Marvel. But on the other hand, as the story goes on, she starts sort of losing control of exactly. the tale. Exactly. Um, there's there's another thing here, another quote that I'm going to read related to the tale. I had, um, so uh, daughter is about to show Ben, her lover. Mm -hmm. She's about to show her the tale for the first time. And she says, quote, I had something to show her too. It was the sum of body and its predecessors. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea also that the tale is connecting, again, connecting back with the past. Mm. Yeah, I was I was thinking about the tale as a kind of umbilical cord too, in a way. Um, that it is also a leash in some ways um, that the grandmother later does hold it like a leash and kind of right. grips it. Um, yeah. And that it, it binds her to her lineage. It's a literal line. Um, but at the same time, she has a certain amount of agency over it as well. Right. Right. Okay. So I just mentioned that daughter has a girlfriend, Ben. Mm -hmm. Um and even though Ben sounds like a, a guy's name, maybe it's actually a woman or a, yeah, which I she mean, does I'm on saying, purpose. Which she does on purpose, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm saying woman, but tell me the age. It's more like they're adolescents, right? They're yeah, I they're think somewhere in between. I think. I think at the very beginning they're like early middle school, and then right. later they're like slightly older. Um, but yeah, like thirteen ish, right? Okay, give or take. Just so yeah. I'm not using the wrong term there. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's one um, queer sort of love story that's going on. And then there's a mention of the third sister. So the daughter's mother's um, sister yeah. has or had a wife. And then there's the gay pirate story, which I'm going to ask you about in a second. So um, why so many, why, why queer love and why different queer love stories in the, in the overall um, work? Yeah, I think in some ways I was just writing out of a sense of loneliness and wanting, I was like, I can't be the only one. <laughs> there are hundreds of people in this family. Like, it's impossible. Uh -huh. um, and so I was writing to kind of populate my own invented history and writing to give myself a history um, that didn't exist anywhere I could see. Um and I specifically, because I also ended up writing that myth of the grandmother and the and the snake spirit. Uh, I was also really, or the not the snake spirit, but like the river that's the a river, snake. right? Um, river that's a snake woman. The river that's a woman. Right. right. <laughs> um, because I was also really interested in how so much folklore, whenever something transgressive happens, it's like, oh, the woman is an animal. <laughs> she's actually a snake. That's why she's awful. <laughs> right. 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 Um, and so I I wanted to. Um, write those stories as well that to me that I had inherited. And I was like, oh, what does it, what, you mentioned the snake woman. Who are you really talking about? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little more, a little more though about this idea. Cause you, you mentioned a couple of times, I saw it in some of your other interviews. How do we get to invent our lineage? Mm. 
Well, I really love, for example, like I think the poet Safia Ohilo once said that uh, that she had like horizontal ancestors. And I really love that idea that your friends could be your ancestors. I think it basically reinvented for myself what a lineage could look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really interested in the idea of a lineage that you choose. Um, but also, again, with the idea of like a speculative history, um, that it's possible to invent the past too, and that the past is not really the past. It's it's still it's still here. Um, yeah. Right, that the past is right here present in, in the mm-hmm. present and it's exerting an influence on the present and we can change yeah. the past in the present. And yeah. Um, yeah, I love all those kind of ideas. And it's it sounds as if it's sort of, again, kind of putting words into your mouth, but it's sort of this idea of chosen family, mm-hmm. but it's chosen family into the past also, mm-hmm. right? And so far yeah. as, um, okay, thanks for that. So let's talk about the gay pirate story specifically because that's another one that there's just a lot going on. There's that's a lot my of favorite. Things. That's my favorite part. Of okay. The book. <laughs> so, so tell me, tell me about that. But did you say you wrote that one first? I think, did you say that earlier or you, that, that was the first like long, like complete section. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So tell me why that's your favorite and tell me why uh, other people are going to be transfixed by it as well. I, I love it because it's just, I, I love genre fiction and I love pirate stories. And I also love this idea. So basically I've been reading a lot about um, like this, this pirate queen who um, was like enemies of all the land empires. Um, so I was really interested in this like decolonial pirate <laughs> um, mm-hmm. who was attacking the ships of various empires and that water is not something that can be controlled in the same way that land can be divided into countries. Mm -hmm. And I was also reading about indigenous um, people in in Hong Kong who were literally banned from setting foot on land. Um, And they essentially were exiled from um, ever ever living on the actual island itself. And because I was so interested in indigenous stories and indigenous history in Taiwan, um, I was thinking a lot about myths of people who decided to become whales and decided to become fish. And I realized, oh, this is a response to colonization. It's a response to the fact that land has become country, has become owned. So in order to escape that ownership, where else but water? Right. Um, and so I wanted to create an origin story for the family that was about a different kind of belonging. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I love that. And you also say, I don't have this line in my notes. I just remember this line. Something about... Um, so the, the captain and the pirate or the, what is it? It's um, the pirate king. No, the pirate king is the captain and yeah. the old, wait, old somebody. Old Guang. Oh yeah. Old yeah. Guang. So it's old Guang and the pirate. So they're the yeah. two who become lovers. Yeah. Um, and, but they, they find a homeland in each other, something mm-hmm. like that you said. And I just, yeah. I just love that whole notion of, like you said, they've been dispossessed of, of their literal homeland and so then again, we have to go back, we have to kind of figure it out on ourselves. and how do, so I've lost that, I've lost that attachment. I've lost the right to be in my literal homeland. So, mm-hmm. so what do I do? We reinvent or we invent exactly, and we get creative and um, yeah. So the, so the, the gay pirate story is definitely a favorite part of the book. <laughs> okay. So talking about um, queer writing and queer stories, we're moving into, well, we've already moved into uh Pride Month. I think I think all June is Pride Month, right? right. And uh, and um, so I wanted to ask you just l- so let's talk about queer writing for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And also this this podcast episode is going to come out the weekend of uh, Gay Pride in San Francisco in New York. So let's talk again a little bit about queer writers and queer writing. It seems as if um, novels that now have even predominantly queer storylines they've kind of been accepted into quote unquote, mainstream, like literary fiction as, as a genre, as you know, 20 years ago, or however long ago that they would have just been categorized off to the side. Yes. Is that your experience? I mean, I, you know, I found out about bestiary just in the, you know, the lists of hot mm-hmm. novels and things like that. I didn't even know it was queer until I started reading it. Cause I, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I knew that I had heard enough about it and I wanted, I was curious. And so I started reading it and I said, like, Oh wait, this is, you know, this is a queer novel. So is that your experience that we've kind of, it's kind of been, it's not the issue that it used to be again, 10 or 20 years ago before you were doing this. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I do think in some ways that is true. There is now a more mainstream audience and also a lot of um, money invested into these stories in a different way. Right. But at the same time, I always feel like, and this was me, like, for example, when I was discovering Dorothy Allison's work, for example, um, in trash and bastard out of Carolina, 
I always thought, okay, you can either write about queerness or you can write about family and immigration. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, and now I think, you know, immigration, it is a queer issue. Fam, all of these things, misog- th- those, it is queer to write about these things and it is possible to write about these things. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think I'm interested in um, also expanding um, what, queerness can look like that isn't the mainstream I think that the idea of like homonormativity mm-hmm. the idea that you can now build a nuclear family and that's the only vision right. of queerness right um where I'm like I want to read more about like queer immigrants mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, people who are precarious in all kinds of ways <laughs> right so um, because that is the experience yeah Well, tell me a little bit more about how you got beyond that. You had that perception that you could, you had to write, you had to choose between writing queer stories and writing family immigrant stories. And then you realized, wait a second, I know Dorothy Allison, you said had reading some of her work had something to do with that. But can you tell us a little bit more about how you realized, wait, this is a self-imposed limitation. It's not, Mm. it's not true. I can do both. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it is really just um, part of the, the media image that, the acceptable form of queerness that is uh, really the only visible, like truly, truly visible kind is like middle-class white um, nuclear family, like that very certain image. And so I was like, Oh, that's the, that's what it means to be like visible and queer. Um, And so reading books like Dorothy Allison or reading like Cho Miao Jing's notes of a crocodile, it made me realize that, um, yeah, that that image was just this like form of respectability politics that I wanted to veer away from. Right. Um, and I definitely think, yeah, and Dorothy Allison too writes specifically about how um, she can in some way, or she, she, she chooses um, not to pass on inter, intergenerational trauma. There's like, there's a certain amount of um, awareness of how queerness creates this divergent path for her um, mm-hmm. that uh, that she's it, and it's not divergent in a negative way it's like right. divergent as in all that shit that came before all of that like compulsive marriage like a compulsive heterosexual like that that was that was terrible I mean I like this idea of like celebrating divergence um, rather than celebrating like assimilation yeah right right what about as a Taiwanese American um, queer writer. I don't know, you know, I'm obviously not Taiwanese American. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know like how much space, because, you know, oftentimes, and I, I mean, again, and you, you're American, you're born here, you grew up here. I understand mm-hmm. that, but still being part of that greater community and maybe you're not that much. I don't know how much you mm-hmm. identify or are part of that community or, or, or are not, but I'm just curious, did that, did that, was, was there any sort of struggle there? Was that any sort of just to be so unabashedly queer and just like, this is what I'm writing? Did you get any pushback or mm. did you just grow up in a, an environment where those in your surroundings were just so supportive? You didn't have to deal with that as much as you might have otherwise. I'm just curious if being part of that, you know, how that did or did not affect your, your being a queer writer. Yeah, I I really hugely identify with being part of a Taiwanese American community. I always, I, when I went to college, I joked with people like, I'm not from here. <laughs> because uh-huh, like uh-huh. the first time I ever saw a white person was when I was like nine and I saw like uh, someone's card with the Virgin Mary like painted on it. Wow. Like I, I grew up in a community that like a white person was like, oh my God, like we couldn't believe it. It was like seeing an exotic animal out in the wild. Interesting. In my high school, like we had, there were so few white kids. And so to me, it was always the default. Like I never felt like, oh, I, I'm on the margins. I'm a minority. Like I, cause I was never the minority uh-huh, in uh-huh. my entire life. And um, so I definitely felt very centered in that Taiwanese American community. Um, and yeah, I think it's really complicated because I feel like, a lot of the Taiwanese American community in America is very Christian, which might be different um, than a lot of, than, you know, being on the island. Um, and yeah, there's definitely, it is an entirely different vocabulary. I didn't even know the words. <laughs> right, <laughs> I right. never, I never heard it mentioned. It was, it's not on, you know, Taiwanese dramas, soap operas that, you know, my parents were watching it. Exactly. It just felt like um, it was entirely outside of my vocabulary yeah so did you get pushback or was it just not something that was really an issue because there wasn't a vocabulary for it 
I think it, I think it was more that I ended up finding the community that I needed right. and I found the people that I was able to like articulate my, yeah, myself with and find that belonging. And I think that's part of what inspired the book. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And also realizing that I had the agency to do so was a huge part of that as well. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So let's talk about in the interest of Pride Month and um, because we're running out of time, let's talk, can you talk about a little bit, I don't know if there's more you wanted to say. I think we kind of, we've obviously touched on Dorothy Allison. I don't know if there's more that you'd like to say about how she's influenced your writing. Mm -hmm. So either about her and or um, some other LGBTQ writers that that are sort of on your radar or have inspired your work. So we can give some shout outs to some some other writers. Yeah, I mean, I also really love Larissa Lai. Um, she writes speculative fiction, and I'm really interested in um, like queerness as speculation. Dorothy Allison, who I mentioned, uh, Chiu Miao Jing, who I really love. Um, there are just yeah, so many writers. I love Justin Torres's We the Animals as well. Mm-hmm. Um, a book that I don't know is like ex- would be explicitly called queer fiction, but that I always felt like had this really subversive, amazing energy is Revenge and the Moo King Fixin by Marilyn Chin. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so all of those books. Okay, all of those are worth checking out. So speaking of checking out in 2022, like I mentioned at the very beginning of our chat, you have another collection coming out. Mm-hmm. So um, tell us about uh, what's, what's, what we can look forward to in 2022. What's, what's this collection? Yeah, so my short story collection in 2022 is called Gods of Want. Um, and it explores a lot of very similar themes, but there it's also very different, <laughs> I think, from Beast Dairy. It's more of a spectrum. Um, it's it's very interested in um, thinking about community and collective voices mm-hmm. um, and kind of also very fabulous. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure it's also very fabulous. <laughs> oh, thank you. I hope thank so. You. Thank you. Speaking of wordplay. <laughs> that, that was great. That, that was, was too really easy. great. <laughs> thank you. That was too Love easy. It. I had to go there. I had to go yeah. there. <laughs> Kaming, I have loved chatting with you. And like I said, best year. I mean, it just, my dreams went crazy. And I mean, I just, I just love your imagination and your writing style. And so thank you so much. And I'm so happy for your success. And um, like I told everyone at the beginning, the paperback is out now. So please check it out. And uh, Kaming, thanks again for making time to talk with us today. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions and for reading the book so carefully and with so much thought. I'm just incredibly honored. Um, So thank you for this conversation. All right. Well, let's do it again when you have your collection out. (laughs) Great. Your fabulous collection. All right. (laughs) Bestiary, like I said, is out now in paperback. For more about the book and K-Ming, you can go to kmingchang.com. I'm Matthew Felix. For more about me, you can go to matthewfelix.com. And for more about the San Francisco Writers Conference, including details about this year's new and expanded writing contest, as well as lots of virtual events and hopefully in-person events soon, uh, as well as how to register for next year's conference because uh, registration is now open uh, underway, you can go to sfwriters.org. Until next time, thanks for joining us.